Hey, hey everybody, holla. Y'all can unmute yourselves. Hi. Hey. <laughs> hey. 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 Good evening, everyone. Good Wednesday night. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello and welcome to the Playground Experiment Voices of America Writers Workshop Presentations number six. I'm David Davila, and I am currently in South Texas, the ancestral land of the Kualotecan and Karankua people. Tonight, we have artists participating from a range of places all over the country or world, depending on uh, who's participating tonight. I think we've got some worldies out there. And you can see several of them right now holding up the names of the indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands they currently are on. We at the PGE acknowledge that wherever we are in this country, we are occupying stolen land and we honor and respect the indigenous people that once lived here as well as the indigenous people who continue to live here and contribute to our society. We at the PGE strive to be inclusive, an inclusive organization for all theater artists. And with that, I'd like to invite everyone else who is participating, participating tonight to turn their cameras on and say hello, everyone say hello. Look at all those beautiful people, the beautiful people, the beautiful people. It's just fabulousness all in here tonight. It is a party. Uh, tonight, uh, we are here to celebrate the work being done in the Voices of America Writers Workshop, uh, which is a program created at uh, the Playground Experiment to give actors and directors um, a chance to learn the skills of playwriting that they may not have known otherwise. And in that program, they start developing new work. And tonight we are going to see that new work from the very beginning, new plays, brand new plays come to life by amazing talented members of the Playground Experiment community, these fabulous actors you see before you. And with that, I would like to ask the actors to go ahead and turn off their cameras and let us see the writers who we're going to meet tonight. Hey, how are y'all feeling? How are you doing? I'm good. Good? That was very awesome. good. <laughs> are we nervous at all are we nervous very <laughs> <laughs> that's okay you know being nervous is all part of it if you weren't nervous it means that you don't care about it but you obviously care quite a lot about this art that you are creating and putting into this world and uh, we're so excited to see that tonight tonight we'll have these four writers uh, so four excerpts and uh, and then we'll call it a night and we will uh, do this again on Friday with four more writers from the Voices of America Writers Workshop. Tonight is the first of two nights. So I hope you'll come back and join us again on Friday. And with that being said, let's jump in, y'all. Let's jump in and, uh, and uh, meet our first playwright of the night, Courtney. Courtney. Yes. Uh, hi. Hi. How hi. are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> Great, I'm great, I'm good. <laughs> you look fabulous. Uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, let's bring your actors out here. And while they're coming on, why don't you tell us a little bit about your play and what you're working on here? Yeah, so this is Undying Wishes. What we're gonna see tonight is the first three-ish scenes. Um, it's about a young woman, Janelle. Who, um, she is helping her mother clean out her grandmother's house. Her grandmother is currently in hospice with Alzheimer's and uh, she comes across her grandmother's diaries from like her Don't give away life. the whole plot. Don't give I'm away, not gonna the, give away plot. the whole plot. <laughs> it's like the first five pages. So it's like, okay, okay, okay. but like, it's like these diaries are a big part of it. So just like look out for these diaries. Okay. Fabulous. And who do we have here uh, performing? Actors, please introduce yourselves. Becca Hoodwin, I'm playing Grandma Gwen. And I'm Claire Scheel, and I play Young Gwen. I'm Kirsten Hopkins. I'm playing Janelle. I'm Tamara Tucker. I'm playing Young Rita. I'm Maria Elena O'Brien. I'm playing Kristen. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Thank you uh, so much. And, and we have Al on stage directions. Is that correct, Al Monaco? Yes, yes. All right. <laughs> There's Al. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, take it away. Take it away. Okay. Undying Wishes by Courtney Sile. Scene one, in attic. 
There are boxes lining the walls full of old fo- photos, knickknacks, and memorabilia. At Rise, Janelle and Kristen enter carrying garbage bags and plastic bins. When was the last time anyone was up here? Probably not since Grandpa died. That was 10 years ago. Well, Grandma didn't know what to do after, so she shoved all his stuff up here. She didn't exactly have much help around here. Now we get to deal with both their shit. Please, not today, Janie. Uh, Sorry, sorry. I just don't even know where to start. Kristen grabs a box and rips it open. (sighs) Should have worn a mask with all this dust. (sighs) Kristen picks through the baby clothes in the box. Here's your christening outfit. I assume it used to be white. Hmm. Looks like the moths have gotten to most of this stuff. Kristen shoves the contents into a garbage bag. Janelle grabs a box and picks through its contents. Seems like there's just a bunch of junk here. It's probably all junk. Great, then let's just dump it and move on to the rest of the house. Janelle, I asked for you to help me today, not give me an attitude. The only time you call me is when you need my help. You just said you wouldn't start. Every time. Let's just get this over with. We just need to find the sentimental stuff and anything valuable, and the dump can have the rest. Start sorting those over there, and I'll pick through these. They go to the opposite ends of the attic. Kristen puts on headphones. Janelle opens a few boxes. She starts sorting the garbage into the bags and the valuables into the plastic bins. Photos, figurines, clothes, stuff that smells like it's been pissed on by a cat. Janelle goes to another box and finds a diary. She flips through the pages. Hey, Mom. Kristen can't hear Janelle. Mom. What? Did Grandma keep a diary? What? Did Grandma keep diaries? There's a few in this box. She would write every now and then. Why? January 23rd, my second semester of school has gotten off to a better start than my first. Kristen opens another box. There's more diaries in here. Janelle picks up another diary. May 3rd, I can't believe it's been a year since graduation. I decided to stay in San Diego longer to pursue work at the local papers. Mom and dad are visiting tonight and I'm excited to introduce them to my friend Rita. Who's Rita? I'm not sure. She never really mentioned her time in California. We always just stayed in Chicago. Janelle opens more boxes full of diaries. There are boxes of these. She must have written every day of her life. When did she have time to write all these? Kristen grabs a diary and starts to flip through it. Can I take these? You really want all her old diaries? They can't be that interesting. She was a mom and a housewife her whole life. You don't think it's amazing she chronicled her entire life? There are decades of stories and experiences here. If you want them, you can take them. Just get them out of here today. We have to get this house empty by the end of the week for the realtor. Kristen wanders to another side of the attic. Janelle sits with the boxes of diaries and sorts them. July 4th. Today, Rita and I went down to the beach to watch the fireworks. She told me she used to come here with her brothers when they were kids to harass the seagulls. Janelle reads a few more pages. A letter falls out of the diary. My dearest Rita, I'm sorry to leave you like this. I never knew I could love someone the way I've loved you. Uh, But my parents will never understand. They've set me up with a nice boy back home. Janelle quickly reads through the rest and hides the letter in her pocket. Janie Hunt, can you grab that box over there? It's full of photos. And where's that girlfriend of yours? She can help lift some of these heavier things. Yeah, she'll be here in about an hour when she's done with work. They rifle through the photos. Grandma and Grandpa looked good together. (laughs) They always knew how to work a camera. Janelle picks up a photo of two women. On On the back, it says Rita and Gwen. Hey, here's Rita again. Kristen doesn't look at the photo. She does look a little familiar, I guess. I wonder if she's still alive. Do you think she'd want to know about Grandma? Janie, we don't even know her last name. We won't be able to find her. There's got to be some way to find her. Facebook, Instagram, a phone book. Grandma must have mentioned her last name in one of those diaries. You really want to spend time looking for an old woman while your grandma is in hospice? I just think Grandma would want us to let her know. 
Grandma doesn't even know what day it is. I doubt she remembers this burrito woman. You don't think Grandma would want to see her old friend before she dies? I, I don't know, Janelle. Maybe. I, if I knew I was dying, I would want my family. Janelle! I asked you to come here and help me clean out this attic, not go on some wild goose chase to find someone your grandmother hasn't seen in nearly 60 years. Don't you want to know about this other life she had before you were born? I want to get this house empty and sold so we can move on with our life. All you care about is selling this house. You grew up in this house. I grew up in this house. I don't need to get into this with you, you right now. You talked to me for two months, and now that Grandma oh. takes the turn, suddenly you need my help again? Everything is always a fight you with you. ignore me and then expect everything to be fine and fucking dandy. Why do you want to find this woman anyways? You don't know her. We haven't heard of her. She could be psychotic or dead for all we know. So against this. Can we at least talk about this? No! I need to take a break. Keep working up here and I'll start on the bedrooms and get those diaries out of here by tonight or I'll burn them. Mom. Kristen exits. Janelle goes back to the box of diaries and sits down again. She looks at the photo of her grandma and Rita. Who are you, Rita? Janelle grabs another diary and starts to read. September 3rd. Today I moved into my dorm room at UCSD. My parents were sad to see me go at the airport this morning, but I'm excited to be in a new state. I had never seen the ocean before. I also met my roommate, Rita. Janelle continues to read silently as lights shift to scene two, a dorm room at UCSD. Young Rita is lounging on her bed, reading a book. Young Gwen enters with a few bags. Hi, you must be my new roommate. What gave it away? I'm Gwen. What's your name? Rita hops Rita. off the bed and shakes Gwen's hand. Rita, nice to meet you. <laughs> I've been so nervous about coming to school. It'll be nice to at least have one friend right away. You're from around here? No, I just flew in from Chicago. My parents weren't able to come help me move in, but I have a cousin out here who helped me drive to campus and show me around. I didn't ask for your life story. Oh, uh, what about you? Where are you from? Here. Neat. So you must really know the area really well. All the best restaurants and fun spots in town. Yeah, sure. Have you decided on a major already? Marine biology. My dad's a professor here in that department. Wow. I wish I was better at science, but that's just not my thing. I was thinking of majoring in- No, wait. Let me guess. English. I mean, I haven't decided yet, but yes, English was one of my top choices that are history. I love learning about- Again, don't care. Listen, Gwen. Gwen, right? A couple of ground rules for the dorm room since we'll be living together for the foreseeable future. One, I need to study as much as I can if I plan on graduating a year early. So quiet hours are every hour. Two, no having people over. Don't care if they're your boyfriend or your best friend. I don't want to see them. Three, keep to yourself and I'll keep to myself. Deal? Seems a bit extreme. I didn't come here to make friends. It's hard enough being a woman in science. The last thing I need is people finding out that my roommate is an English major. So do we have a deal? Uh... Do we have a deal? I stay out of your way and you stay out of mine. Fine. They shake hands. Rita goes back to reading her book as young Gwen unpacks. Young Gwen and young Rita freeze as Janelle flips through the pages, almost like they are fast forwarding through time. October 5th. I wish I could say after a month of living together that things with Rita have gotten better, but they haven't. She's just so stern all the time. I was surprised today when she almost smiled. Young Gwen and young Rita are studying. Young Gwen sighs loudly and keeps glancing at young Rita. If you have something to say, you might as well say it. I don't want to say anything. You keep looking at me. No, I don't. Gwen. Fine. 
I'm having trouble with this math homework. And you're a math person. So I was wondering if- Margarita hops off her bed. Let me see it. Really? Thank you. Young Rita glances over the homework. I'm just having trouble with this equation. Every time I do it, it comes out wrong. Oh, well, this is why. Young Rita writes out the equation. Well, you made all that look easy. Once you know what you have, it's just plugging the numbers into the equation. We can't all be math geniuses. Young Rita notices how close her and Gwen are to each other. She moves abruptly and goes back to her homework. If you're still having trouble, let me know. They go back to their homework. How about instead of torturing ourselves with math for another hour, we take a break and grab some dinner? Mm, I shouldn't. I have a paper due tomorrow. Are you sure? I feel like you never eat. Do you want me to bring you anything? I think it's meatloaf night uh, in the dining hall. I'll pass. Well, if you change your mind, I'll be down there for an hour or so. Don't study too hard. Young Gwen exits. Young Rita watches her go. Damn it. Young Rita freezes as Janelle flips through the pages again. I can't help but feel Rita is hiding something from me. I'm not sure what it is. She's always so quiet and secretive. But everyone has secrets. Hmm. The entry ends there. Janelle stands and goes to the frozen young Rita. What is going on in that head of hers? Young Rita exits as Kristen enters. Janelle is abruptly pulled from the memory. Come on. Your girlfriend is here. Get all these downstairs. Okay. Kristen and Janelle each grab a box and exit. Scene three. A hospital room. Gwen is in bed writing. She seems alert, but there is an unsteadiness in her hands. The room is sterile, but homey. Blankets, photos, flowers. Janelle enters, carrying one of her old diaries and a small cake box. Morning, Grandma. Oh, Janie, how nice to see you. Come in, come in. How are you feeling today? Tired. The nurses keep giving me these damn meds that make me want to do nothing but sleep. Well, they're supposed to help you feel better, more comfortable. Sweetheart. If I'm going to go any day now, I don't need to feel good or sleep. I can be comfortable when I'm dead. Well, I'll try and talk to the nurse and see if they can lower the dose. I brought you something. It's your favorite, red velvet. <laughs> Love, you didn't have to do that. I know you hate the food here, and Mrs. Peters was making cupcakes down the hall yesterday and thought of you. Well, you tell her I say thank you. I can't stand another day of the jello pudding cup. Mm. Gwen takes a shaky bite. Mm. How have you been? I haven't seen you in so long. I was just here yesterday, Grandma. Were you? I must have been sleeping. Mom wanted me to drop by today before going back to the house to finish packing up the attic. I told your mom not to sell that house. Too many memories in those walls for it to be given to someone else. I know, but you know how she gets. Oh, you two aren't still fighting, are you? No, we're doing fine now, for now. You know, your mother loves you more than anything. If you say so. Gwen pauses. A moment passes. A sort of droning sound comes and goes quickly. Gwen looks at Janelle again. Oh, Janie, when did you get here? <laughs> Just a few minutes ago, you were writing and I didn't want to disturb you. Oh, dear, you can disturb me anytime. I just wanted to stop by and say hello before going back to the house to help mom. I told your mother not to sell that house yet. It'll be worth more in a couple of years. Well, you know how mom gets. She just wants to get it done and over with now. But I was helping her in the attic when I found some of your old diaries. Janelle hands Gwen the diary. Oh, my. I haven't read these in decades. I can't imagine they're terribly interesting. Well, I read through a few of the entries just out of curiosity, and I noticed you talked about someone named Rita a lot. And then I came across this photo when we were packing up the photo albums. Do you know who that is? Oh, that was my friend Rita. We were roommates in college. I haven't talked to her in decades, though. What sparked this sudden nosiness into my face? Just curiosity, I guess. I didn't mean to pry too much, but 
Do you know where Rita may be now or her last name? You know your mother never liked Rita. Always hated when she would come to visit. Even as a baby, she would cry and cry when Rita tried to hold her. I'm never having kids, she would say. Mom said she didn't know Rita. Oh, I do miss her quick wit. She would cut you down in three words or less. I always told her it's because she's an Aries, but she never believed any of that astrology crap. I bet she's still in San Diego somewhere dancing on the beaches. Would you like to see her again? If, if I can find her and bring her here, would that make you happy? She won't want to see me like this. It would make her too upset. Grandma, do you know her last name? Is she still alive somewhere? I, I don't know, Janelle. It's a lot to ask of an old woman who lives on the other side of the country. Gwen pauses and looks at Janelle a moment, the droning sound again. Gwen seems uncertain of her surroundings. Kristen? I told you to stop fussing over me. It's just gallbladder surgery. I'll be fine. Did, did they move me to a new room? No, Grandma, it's me, Janelle. You're in the care facility. Oh, you're worse than your father when it comes to hospitals. He never liked the way they smelled. But he said he would face his fears and come to see me when the procedure's over. That damn boss of his wouldn't give him the morning all. Janelle starts to play along. I'm sure he'll get here as soon as he can. He better. Are you nervous? No, if it's my time, it's my time. I don't think today is that day. No use worrying over something you can't control. I, I think I'll just close my eyes until it's all over. Janelle watches as Gwen drifts to sleep. She opens the diary she brought and starts to read passages aloud to Gwen. December 17th. I learned today that I probably won't be able to go home for Christmas break. My parents can't afford the plane ticket back, and I don't have a car to drive all the way back to Chicago. My cousin offered to take me north to Oregon to visit her husband's family, but I think I'll just stay here and see what a sunny Christmas is like. Lights shift to end of scene. Yay! Yay! Cast and crew, take a bow, take a bow. <laughs> Courtney, great work, great work. Can't wait to see where this goes. And actors, wow, really, really bringing that commitment to the scene. That's so interesting. And gosh, the levels there, the levels. Um, wow. Um, fabulous, fabulous work. Great job, great job. You keep writing this. Keep writing, bring it to the playground experiment. When Mike sends out these emails asking you if you wanna participate, click yes and, and bring more pages, okay? Keep working on it, all right? And, and that goes for all of you. <laughs> you know who I'm talking to. <laughs> um, fabulous. Well, up next, uh, up next, we have the one, the only Jacqueline. Jackie, are you there? Hi. Yes. Hi. How are you? Doing well. Excited Fabulous. to be here. Yay. Well, as your casting cast come on, uh, tell us a little bit about your piece without giving it all away. Uh, and, and let's introduce your cast. Yes. Um, so my piece is called Dangerous Cycles, and it's um, about the cycles of domestic violence. Um, but it also has a lot of the Latino flavor and what, you know, characterizes us. So hope you like it. And um, I'll let my actors um, present themselves. Great. Actors. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm playing Rosita. Hi, I'm Alessandra. I'm playing Anna. Hi, I'm Mike. Uh, I'll be playing boyfriend slash man's voice. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. And I'll be playing Maya. I'm Alexandra. I'll be playing Viv. And I'm Maria. I'll be playing Raquelita. Fabulous. We'll take it. And who's on stage directions? Al. Oh, Al. Al. Hi, Al. Amazing, Al. 
<laughs> Fabulous. Take it away. <laughs> Great. So here we go. Dangerous Cycles by Jacqueline Segui Rodriguez. Act one, scene one. Restaurant, Puerto Rico, present. Ana, a 28-year-old Latina, is waiting for her two cousins and best friends. Ana is wearing a dress and Converse shoes. She is waiting at the only good restaurant in a 30-mile radius, El Jibarito. The restaurant is a bit dated, but the fami familiarity and memories it holds make it the perfect place to connect with the primas Anna hasn't seen in forever. Where are you, Viv? Been trying to get a hold of you for a while now. Are you guys coming at all? I hope you guys are okay. Just call me back. As she hangs up, a waiter, Rosita, 40s to 50s, approaches her. Rosita is a sweet lady that has worked all her life at this restaurant, and it shows. She talks and walks like her whole life lies on her shoulders. I mean, Inya, do you want me to get you something while you wait? I've called over and over, and he goes straight to voicemail. Do you think they'll show up? I'm starting to get worried. Well, they're probably driving through that spotty area near the cemetery. Why, I worry that something may have happened to them on the way. I'm sure they'll be here soon. Ten un poco de fe. Ay, maybe a piña colada will make you feel better. No, it's okay, Rosita. I'll just wait. Ay, no te hagas de rogar. I'll even add some extra cherries on top. <laughs> you still remember. I mean, how could I forget? I'll be right back. <laughs> Rosita walks away and Anna dives into her phone. She opens up Insta and dives into cat reels. She laughs and keeps swiping. The next video is of her cousin Maya filmed by her boyfriend. She plays it. Wait, why are you filming me? I just wanted to let you know how much I love you. So I got a surprise for you. A surprise for me? Yes, but you must wear this blindfold. Oh my God. Um, okay. Boyfriend made a very romantic dinner. Once there, he takes her blindfold off and proposes. She looks very surprised and not exactly happy. Anna is not amused by what she sees. Rosita is back with the drink and places it on the table. The drink has two tiny umbrellas and a note pinned on the side. Here it is. Rosita, it looks just like I did when I was eight. <laughs> mm, it tastes like it too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Para mi niña. She gets up and hugs Rosita. Ay, nena. Don't start crying because I'll never be able to stop. It's just coming here brings back so many memories. It makes me feel happy and innocent again. I remember those late nights helping me with homework. <laughs> Rosita sits. How could I forget? Those algebra assignments gave me nightmares for weeks. Ah, you were always there, though. It didn't matter how hard it looked. You always reminded me I could do it. That's what your mamita would have wanted. That's true. This place missed you, Anna. Hmm? You know, every now and then I have to take a minute just to look around the restaurant and think about all those beautiful memories it's held for the last two decades. Años. Already, Rosita? Wow. Time has flown by. Why, this place was always packed. It was. But nothing has been the same since your mamita died. She was the spirit of this place. She was. People loved her. See me, Nina. Mm -hmm. Coping with her death was the hardest thing I have ever gone through. Raquelita was my best friend, mi hermana. She really loved this place. And all she could ever think about was you and your quinces. Oh, my quinces. <laughs> it's been a while. Ay, ni para tanto. <laughs> She talked about your special day for years. <laughs> I miss her. Ay. Yo también la extraño. Oh. 
So, why New York? Hmm? <laughs> why did you disappear all of a sudden without saying goodbye? Finding your letter that morning broke my heart. Oh, I'm sorry, Rosita. After years of avoiding uncomfortable conversations and encountering painful memories over and over, I, I just needed to breathe for a while. A part of me died the day Mamita disappeared and her death still haunts me. She didn't deserve to die that way. Mamita was kind and beautiful. She loved everyone. Her only sin was not recognizing that she was enough and giving her life to him. Two actors come on stage and impersonate Ana's memory. Young Ana, eight years old, and Mamita Rakalita, third, early 30s, are sitting at a corner table for two, sharing a piece of cake. A combination of lighting and wardrobe should help the audience understand that we are about to, what we are about to see is a memory. Ay, siempre recuerda que eres bella, inteligente, fuerte y libre. Nunca permites que te digan lo contrario, okay? Don't let no man get in the way of your dreams. Mamita, I'm never getting married. I will always live with you. Die, mi amor. Wait until you're a teenager. You'll hate my guts and you'll want to move out as soon as possible. Oh, no, I know I won't because I love you, mamita. <laughs> okay, mi amor. I love you too. Here, you can have the rest of the cake. A man's voice from afar is heard. Raquelita! Rakalita and young Anna jump from fright. Light shift. Back to reality. Anna is tearing up. Rosita, I feel like I failed her. Why would you say that, mi niña? Before Anna could even think about responding, the doorbell on top of the restaurant door rings. Viv and Maya, both in late 20s, walk in. Viv is the ultimate let's fiesta all day cousin. She is a free spirit who doesn't like labels or sticking to, to traditions. Maya is sweet, prefers books over TV, is slightly insecure and very traditional. Maya has never been single for more than a few weeks since she was 15. Donde estas? Could you be a little louder? Uh, yeah, for sure. Anna! Maya grunts. Anna wipes her tears and comes running towards them. They hug. Where have you two been? I'm so relieved you guys are okay. We would have been on time if Miss Know-It-All over here would have listened. I told her we need to leave at 6 to get there on time. But no, she decides to get in the shower at 5.45 p.m. And I don't know if you remember this, but she takes way too long to wear her hair and makeup. Well, mi amor, I couldn't find the right shoes to match this outfit, okay? Plus, looking this good takes time. <laughs> you guys haven't changed one bit. I'm so glad to see you. Anna hugs them again, really hard. I see you haven't changed either. We're glad to see you too, but can you let go? You're suffocating me. Anna, Wait. let's go. I'm sorry. I know I can be clingy, but I've just missed you. Maya's phone dings. She reads a text message. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I am starving. Guess what? I got us our usual booze. Follow me. Maya's phone starts to ring. I need to use the bathroom, um, but I'll catch up with you in a minute. Anna and Viv walk to the booth, and we hear Maya answer her phone on her way to the bathroom. What? This place really hasn't changed a bit. Oh, I know. I can't believe Rosita is still here, like after all these years. Didn't she used to be in love with your uncle, El Feo, that always dressed up like a cowboy? I totally forgot about that. He was always such a unlovable uncle. Ugh, yeah, I hated being around him. He always made me feel so uncomfortable. I, me too. He probably cheated on Rosita or something. She once mentioned they had ended things, but I never knew why. Maya comes back from the restroom and brings a wine bottle under her arm. Did you notice a couple of those picture winning their super caliente hot wings eating contest is still up? This place is like a time capsule. Maya starts to pour half a glass of wine for each one. Where did you get that? I bumped into Rosita on my way over here. She's always been so sweet. Um, you better fill that to the top. Didn't she used to date your uncle, uh, the ugly cowboy? 
What a coincidence. We were just talking about him, right, Anna? <laughs> comes out of the kitchen and places a delicious sortido on the table. Mm-hmm. Bienvenida, mis niñas. I haven't seen you in so long. Rosita, you have not changed a bit. Look at you with your orange lipstick. Popping. <laughs> <laughs> Look at all this. She is still the same Malcahueta that used to take us to the beach on those hot summer days. I, it was nothing. Rosita, you were the only one mommy would let me go out with. Mommy used to say, I'll get you to go with Rosita because I've known her all my life and I trust her, okay? But don't get used to it. <laughs> Thea Carmen is crazy. She would call my mom to convince her to like not let me go out. Why? She would call Mamita too. All worried about sweet little Maya. Mm. She did call me once to make sure I wouldn't let you drown. <laughs> mom is something. Hi, she's still my favorite Thea. Because it's the only one you have. Rosita, this looks delicious. I knew you would appreciate comfort food that made you remember Los Viejos Tiempos. They start digging in. Thank you, Rosita. You're an angel. Mm, por nada, mi niña. This quesito frito mm, is to die for. <laughs> Do you want a diet? Uh... Starting tomorrow. That's what you said yesterday. Uh, who can say no to Rosita's quesitos? Hmm? Could you bring us another wine bottle? Viv is drinking it all. Uh, who are you now? The wine police? I can't help it. It's my favorite wine, so shut it. <laughs> of course. I'll be back in a minute with another bottle. Rosita exits to the bar. So, I'm Maya. You have any news to share? Oh yeah, she got engaged. Babe, that was not your news to share. Ay, por favor, everyone already knows her boyfriend posted it everywhere. Maya drinks what's left on her wine glass and hides her hand as she is not wearing a ring. No, I saw it today and I was mad. Why didn't you call me? You didn't think your prima would want to know? She was probably too busy polishing her little ring. Ooh, is it big? Let me see it. Viv takes Maya's hand and puts it in front of Anna. They notice she is not wearing a ring. Where is it? Did you leave it at our apartment? Maya gathers her thoughts and lies. Well, um, Daniel had to take it to the jewelers uh, to resize it. It it was huge. (laughs) So who are you picking as your maid of honor? Me, of course. (laughs) Are you sure she's not picking cousin Brenda over you? She better not. Brenda was such a bully. Oh, I remember. Anyway, can we talk about my engagement later? You're the one who's visiting. So tell us about New York. Is it as amazing as everyone says? Yo, how is Rosita not losing it after like so many years of working in this place? Viviana, focus. I bet Ana has lots of juicy stories for us. Uh, New York has been good. I I just needed a break. Nothing juicy or exciting. A break from what? (gasps) Or from who? (gasps) You found the one already. Boyfriend? Or girlfriend. (laughs) You're funny. Come on, you need to tell us. Otherwise, no more wine for you, mijita. (laughs) You need to share the deets with us. Why didn't I know about this before? Rosita. Yes, mi niña. Ana has someone back in the city. Did you know? Why does she? Stop it. My God, you poor thing. He broke up with you, right? Oh, mi amor, I know how you feel. But listen, everything will be okay. I'm sure you'll find another billion dollar boyfriend soon. She is not like you, okay? Maybe she doesn't believe in relationships or marriage. I don't know that. I think I'll go get that wine bottle myself. Yes, I do. For one, I'm not anything like you. That's because you were born on another planet. No, no, mi amor. I was born here just like you, but I see the world differently. Ahora me vas a decir que no sueñas con un vestido blanco y una boda grande? Shocker, I don't. No one believes that. You need to stop living in the 50s. Maya notices Anna has left the table. You see what your big mouth does? It's God being honest, okay? 
Anna's phone dings. Viv picks the phone up and reads. New voicemail. Should we listen to it? No. We shouldn't invade her privacy like that. Oh, come on. I know you want to know. What if it's her significant other? I don't know. Do sabes que te gusta el chisme? The mystery is killing you. Fine, fine. Just do it fast before she comes back. Viv plays the voicemail. Viv and Maya listen very carefully. You have one voice message. Message one. Anna, why aren't you answering your phone? Why did you fucking leave? After all I've done for you, you just disappear? I don't care where you are. You know I'll find you. Anna walks toward the booth with a wine bottle in her hands. As she approaches, she hears the last part of the message. <laughs> you think you can hide from me, Bonita? I have people already looking for you, and when I find you, you'll wish you were never born. End of message. Viv and Maya place the phone on the table and look at each other in shock. Anna lets the wine bottle drop and breaks. Viv and Maya go to Anna and embrace her. Light shift. End of scene. Yo. Yo, yo, yo. Oh, man. Uh, yes, cast and crew, please take your bows. Please take your bows. Um, great job, Jackie. Jackie. Um, really scary. Michael, we lost you in the middle. We lost your, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, sorry, excuse <laughs> no, me. No, I feel bad. <laughs> um, but we, we may do, this is live theater, everyone. This is live theater. Uh, Jacqueline, great job. Keep working, keep writing. We love these characters. We love the dynamics. Um, so real, it's just so real. And we, we live for this. And um, ooh, the suspense right there at the end. That's scary. Uh, so keep working on it. Bring your pages to the volumes of the PGE. Sign up for it when Mike sends out the email and keep writing this. Keep working on it. Um, Thank you. Oh, I, I want to announce something, but I can't announce it yet. Darn it. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Where are we? Um, next up. Next up, we have Scenarius. Uh, Scenarius, are are you there, Scenarius? It's me, Margaret. Hi. How are you, Danu? Good. How are you guys? I'm I'm fabulous. Thank you for asking. Uh, as we welcome your cast and crew here, can you tell us a little bit about your piece, a little background without giving it away? Yes, absolutely. I will try my best to not give it away. So it's called Desert Dreams. Ironically <laughs> enough, I dreamed about it. Um, so that kind of came full circle. I didn't really think about that till the other day. Um, but it's about a, well, it's, it's about a lot of different people. But the main character that it starts off with, she basically goes on this journey to find her mom. Um, we don't know what happens. We just know that um, in her youth, um, her mom was taken. So we see that journey. Um, I don't really want to give away too much else. Is that okay? Does it take it, does it take place in? Can you tell us if it's like? Well, no, no, no. It's fantasy uh, land. Oh, so it's okay. not. It takes place not, in a I haven't come up okay. with a title for it yet. So it, it's okay, something okay, okay. within the realm of fantasy. Great, fabulous. Okay, we have everyone here. Who's? Uh, can we introduce ourselves, actors? I am Arthur, and I'm playing the father. I'm Eternanda. I'm playing Nyla, the daughter. I'm Christine and I'm playing Asia. I'm Star and I'm playing Zaylene. I'm Brandon and I'm playing Josiah. Fabulous. And 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 Mac, you're reading stage directions, is that correct? Yes. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, well, take it away. Desert Dreams by Cenarius Thurmond. Act one, scene one. Father, Nyla, and Zaylene are walking through the desert and finally stop. It is hot and you can tell by the way Father and Nyla sit down that they have been there a while. Zaylene is unfazed. I remember I was sitting and mom had just brought me some stew and you were outside. And, and then I heard yelling and mom put me in this basket and ran out and you told her to go back inside and, and I climbed out of the basket and looked outside and there was this red smoke or, or dust or in, in the air and there were three men dragging mom away and I, I didn't see you but then 
suddenly you were in front of me, rushing me inside. And I kept screaming, what about mom? What about mom? And you told me to hush. And Father and Zaylene and give each other a look. And, and that day, mom, she had worn her hair out. It was magnificent. <laughs> I wanted to stick my hands in her hair and I love sticking my hands in her hair. And then I, I would pretend my hand got stuck and she would act surprised and I would keel over laughing. Mom had her hair out that day. She was wearing brown sandals and a green tunic with a hint of gold and, or was it a gold tunic and with hints of green. Or maybe the sandals were green and the tunic was brown and she had on gold jewelry. Oh, no, no. Maybe it was copper jewelry. And, Mila, and please drink. Rest. There's no use of obs obsessing over the details. Father offers Neela the canteen. All I have are details. I want to remember ex her exactly the way she was. That way, when we find her, I know where she is. If we find her, Neela. The council said that they have already divined of your mother's passing. I have since grieved and made peace with it. I allowed for this journey only so that you could do the same. You didn't allow for anything. You let that council rule you and when you should be ruling them, your complacency is showing, Father. The council has long existed before us, Neela. It is only right. We honor and respect their wisdom. Uh, uh, they have okay. seen things we can only dream of. Okay, and so have you. <laughs> you said yourself that when I succeed the throne, you will become a part of the council. Yes, but for right now, I am not. And so we must honor those that came before us. You know what I think? I think that deep down, you also don't believe that she is dead. I think that's why you agree to come with me. I agreed because you insisted and the council thought it would be a good idea. The council just wanted you gone so that they could take over your kingdom while you were away. Nyla Adesembo Abaya, rest, drink. I don't want to hear another word about it. Father turns over to go to sleep. Zaylene begins to speak. <clears throat> I remember the day your mother was taken. I had just begun my training. Just a week prior, your mother had insisted on meeting and speaking to each new recruit. She brought us stew and told us to never lose sight of why we were here. That to fight just for the sake of fighting is simply just the fire of pride and ego. When you feel an inescapable burning in your core and it feels like the great beyond is beneath your chest, that is when you know you must defend yourself, your family, your land. That is a fight. She told us never to fight for someone else. She said we are a part of the Royal Guard, but the Royal Guard is not what makes us warriors. That we walk a path of our own choosing with guidance from our creator. It is up to us to listen to that guidance, to move closer and feel the warmth of it burning. Zaylene lies down. There are two fires within you, princess. Make sure you're feeding the right one. Scene two. Asia sits on the couch reading a book when Josiah, her husband, enters. Hey, babe. What are you reading? Asia does not glance up or respond. Hello. I said, what are you reading? <laughs> Must be good since you ain't hearing me. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's called Desert Dreams. I got it from the thrift store up the street. I figured I'd get it to pass the time while I'm not writing. It looks like a Pandora's box kind of book. Yeah, that's what I said too. What with all these beautiful jewels embedded in the cover, uh, there was also this older woman hawking me down when I bought it. She followed me out of the store. She asked me if I was prepared for a journey. I said, of course, I love reading. Then she laughed, handed me this and walked away. Asia pulls out a key attached to a ribbon. <laughs> what does it go to? I don't know. 
is probably just a prop or something. Let me see it. Asia hands the key over to Josiah. He looks over it and then looks up as if in a trance. Release the book. It does not belong to you. The journey is not yours to take. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. <laughs> Are you finished yet? What? You don't believe in object possession? You're stupid. Stupidly good looking? Nah, just stupid. Well, you must have a thing for stupid thing. You're right. I must do. Josiah settles into the couch. So what's, what's this book about anyways? Oh, okay. So there is this family, right? And they're a happy family. Well, more than happy. They have everything a person could want in their whole entire life. Their royalty, both mother and father, come from some of the strongest bloodlines in the region. There are like even legends about them that they drink their blood so you can obtain their riches and power and they're born that they're born with. Well, maybe even magical powers. Well, is it true? But obviously that's just a legend, right? Wrong. Or maybe, right? I don't know. I haven't gotten there yet. Anyways, so one day these bad guys come for them to obtain some powers or info from the father who is also the king. But something goes wrong and they end up taking his wife. Classic fantasy adventure. Leaving a child motherless and a husband queenless. The kingdom sent out search parties, but eventually their council, which is like their elders and the people with crazy powerful spiritual gifts, divined that she was dead. So a part of their tradition, uh, they mourned for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long ass time for an entire village to mourn somebody. No, it isn't. If I died, you'd probably mourn more like forever. <laughs> Who said that? Excuse me? I mean, yeah, I mean, I give it a week or two out of respect, but I mean, it would be a shame to keep this face off the market for too long. Asia throws the book at him. It lands on the floor with a thud. I'm kidding. You know I would be devastated if something happened to you. Yeah, I know. I left for my parents for a week and you cried like a baby the whole time. I did not. My allergies were bad that week. I've got the voicemails to prove it. Give me those. You'll have to catch me first. <laughs> Asia jumps off the couch and Josiah chases her. He chases her, but she breaks away and runs off stage laughing. Scene three. Nyla, father, and Zaylene are traveling again. Nyla pulls out a map and looks at it, turns it upside down, looks at it again, turns it another way, looks at it once more. Where did you get that map? I drew it. What your father means to say is, why are you now following this map instead of the course I charted for your mother's homelands? Because. Because what? Nila, I grow impatient with your insolence. Zaylene is one of the greatest warriors and navigators that we have. Yet you disregard all the work she has done to get us this far. Father, you're being dramatic. <laughs> uh, wasn't it you who taught me that to dream is to travel and that if a land calls you, you must go? Yes. And that was from a scary story of battle. I did not intend. Well, I am simply following that calling. This map appeared to me in my dreams. I also said that a dream can be a portal in which enemies attack and throw you off course. General, it is quite all right. I've known for some time that Nyla deviated from the chartered path. Where she now leads us are the original ancestral lands of her mother's people. If you knew that, why didn't you say something earlier? I wanted to see if you knew where you were going. You could have said something, though. Princess, discovery makes itself most known with a whisper and not a scream. OK, whatever. What do you mean by original ancestral land? Your mother's people were pushed off their original land during the reign of the great-great-grandfather of your great-grandfather. They settled in Zarin, which came to be known as the only land your people have known. Few know the story of the original lands. Who pushed them off their land? And why doesn't anyone know about this information? And how do you know more about my history than me? It is said that those who took over the land possess great proficiency in the dark arts. 
They were able to take the land by sending the city underground, trapping the inhabitants and making them work to power the city. A large number of your people were able to escape, but some stayed behind to make it possible. The council at the time voted to keep this knowledge on a need to know basis. Only the council, reigning royals, and the upper circle of warriors are briefed on the matter. Why? Why would they just leave them behind? No one returned for them? The council decided it would be too risky. Those who stayed behind knew the weight of their sacrifice. Father, did you know about this? <sighs> yes, my child. And you didn't tell me? It would have been part of your training before you took the throne. <sighs> are there still people? Or did they all die? I've already said too much. Tell me, tell me, are my people still there? It is said that the city can only be powered by those of your bloodline. Then that means that they would have had to keep reproducing in order to power the city. That means they could still be there being held captive, enslaved by the invaders. We are taught in our training that the city and its inhabitants are long gone. Uh-uh, uh-uh, a city doesn't just vanish whether it's covered in sand or not. If those people were as skilled in dark arts as you say, then they would have found, they would have found a way to still be alive and still subjugate my people to who knows what the, to who knows what horrors. Let's continue our journey. The land has called you in order for you to pay respects. It has been centuries since someone has consecrated the land. Who last consecrated it? It is not my place to know. Father? Zaylene is right. Let us continue moving forward. Nyla has lost the battle, but the outcome of the war is still yet to be seen. She drops her head and follows Father and Zaylene off stage. Blackout. End of excerpt. Yay. Fabuloso. Oh, oh my, the voices, the voices. Where's it gonna go? What's it gonna, what is it gonna do? What is it gonna be? Oh, you gotta keep, everyone take a bow, by the way, I've been saying that, but please take, take your bows. It's fabulous work, keep working on it. I sound like a broken record, but I really mean it. I mean, I feel like you can't tell playwrights enough to, to uh, keep writing. You gotta tell them. <laughs> 50 times a day, keep writing, keep writing. Uh, <laughs> but great work, great start. Very interested to see where this goes. Uh, thank you, and thank you actors for your brilliant work. Um, we have one more, uh, and and we're we're gonna call it a night after that. So, um, Darpan, are you there? Darpan, please. Hey. And Darpan's cast, please, as we, as we welcome you to the stage. Darpan, please tell us a little bit about your work um, and uh, without giving it away. Well, it's a play titled uh, Breathing Fire. And uh, it's a story about three couples at different stages in their relationship, all meeting up for uh, one of their birthdays. And uh, yeah, with that said, I'd let uh, the cast introduce themselves and go from there. See you all on the flip side. <laughs> cool. <laughs> hey, I'm Imran. I'll be uh, reading for Rahul. Hey, I'm Mahima Segal. I'd be reading for Amna. Hey, I'm Priyanka. I'm reading Vro. Hey, I'm Amrith. I'll be reading Nav. I'm uh, Chris. I'll be reading Mike. Hi, my name is Angela. I'll be reading Kim. Fabulous. And who's on and who's on stage directions? Al is on stage directions. <laughs> Hi, Al. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, we'll take it away without further ado. Great. Breathing Fire by Darpin Joshi. Amna moves to the music and sings along with the bits and pieces that she remembers as she walks about the stage, tidying up the space. 
Amna pulls out a gorgeous clear vase from one of the cabinets and pours a couple of cups of water into it. And as she places the vase in the middle of the kitchen island, the doorbell buzzes. Amna hits a button on her cell. Rahul enters, a satchel hangs off one shoulder, carries a box of craft beer in one hand and a large paper bag in the other. Hi, how's it going? Yeah, good. Rahul dumps the satchel on the kitchen island and drops the paper bag on the floor and carefully puts the box of beer in the fridge. Everyone will be here soon. How about you go and freshen up? Sorry, stuff came up. Oh, shit happens. As is the nature of shit, you know, to happen. And now you gotta go take, now you gotta go get to, you know, go take one, so. <laughs> Amna whacks Rahul's butt as he exits stage left. She quickly grabs the satchel and chucks it behind him. Amna returns to the paper bag on the floor and pulls up a bouquet of roses, which she inspects. A bit disappointed since there are a dozen red roses mixed with a dozen of other pink and yellow roses. She measures the length of the roses against the vase and places the bouquet back in the paper bag on the floor. Rahul returns, hair, neck, and back still damp from a shower, a colorful towel tied around his waist. Happy birthday, sweetie. Happy anniversary, love. Well... It's not the exact time yet. We shall have to wait just a little bit longer. That's not fair. But I do have a present for you. What? Rahul undoes the towel, holds the free ends apart, and gyrates. Yeah, baby. Come and get some. Ooh, honey. You know that there's hot water in the shower, right? Come warm me up, huh? Huh? Come on, baby. Behave. It's my birthday. Rahul rewraps the towel. And it's my anniversary. And it's my birthday and anniversary. And so? And so? Amna walks over to Rahul, flips her colorful scarf around his neck like a vermala, and slides her hands down on the free ends of the scarf, pulling them taut. As Amna's hands travel further down, Amna pushes Rahul into the couch and with one hand and yanks his towel off with the other. Amna laughs as she saunters away to the bedroom offstage. Honey, I'm freezing over here. I see that in front of my very eyes. Who knew it could get this cold in here? Amna returns, holding something behind her. She inches closer to Rahul while dancing slowly and seductively. Rahul covers himself up with the scarf as Amna approaches. That warm you up, sugar tits? Hey, that's my line. Amna shoves clothing at Rahul, steps back and observes Rahul dressing himself on the couch. Once dressed enough, Rahul rises, drapes the scarf over Amna, and they slow dance over to the kitchen island where Rahul reaches into the paper bag on the floor and presents the bouquet of roses to Amna. Happy birthday, anniversary, Mon Amour. Je t'aime. Love you too. What's with all these colors? Oh, you know, uh, the reds are for love. And the yellow... The friendship, joy... The point is, you're not just love. For me, you are all these other emotions, too. Reds, yellows, pink, and orange? All of them are a part of you and I. Amna digs her face into the bouquet and takes a couple of deep breaths and places them into the vase. It's been... I know. Maybe it's time for a gut check. You're mine, and that's all there is to it. I love you, but I don't want to waste time towards something. All in or all out. I, I get it. I, I really do. But it, what if your vision, our ideas of what and who we are and how we are related, these definitions are just human constructs? Honestly, what if everything we thought of and know is false? What are you talking about? What if? Don't feed me your what-if bullshit. It's all just attachment to words and ideas that don't fit into the modern world. The doorbell buzzes. Amna taps her cell phone. Love is love, and love is all there is. Without definition? Without expectation. Nav and Ro enter the, and beeline for hugs with Amna first, then Rahul. Oh, we the first ones here. Told you. Shut up. Nav holds up a bottle of bourbon. You know the drill. Rahul and Nav walk, walk over to the bar area of the kitchen counter at stage left. Amna and Ro walk over to the coat rack on stage right. Shots, 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 shots. Babe, we just got here. Nav laughs as he rearranges the bar on the counter. Rahul and Nav make a large pitcher of drinks. Did we just walk into the middle of something? I was trying to talk to him about where we are headed and stuff, and he goes mm. off on some random tangent. Yeah, yeah, avoidance. He does that too. I literally have to push him into a corner just to be able to talk about anything important. 
<laughs> well, the bouquet is pretty interesting. Uh, he actually had a good reason for that. What do you think they're talking about right now? Talking shit about you, bro. Is that right? Shit for days. Story of my life. It's all downhill from here, bro. Run while you still can. It's not, it's not too late. It's when, not. E when exactly would it be too late? It's too late by now, for sure. And you and I need to talk. I'm about what? <laughs> this whole too late stuff? That's kind of been coming up a lot with you lately. There is nothing to talk about. <laughs> we'll talk about it when we get home. Like I said, there's nothing to talk about. Bro, stop while you're ahead. There will always be something to talk about. I'd like to talk about a couple of things too. How about a round of shots first? Amna and Ro exchange a look. Rahul and Nav do a shot and make a large pitcher of drinks. A knock on the door. Amna opens the door. Mike and Kim arrive. Happy birthday. Happy anniversary. Oh, thank you so much. Wait, you guys met on your birthday? How cool. <laughs> it's pretty special. Lucky me. And it makes it easy to celebrate. So you must have a lot of people coming then. Mm, just us. No more big parties. Oh no, I've heard so much about your parties. Things change over time. And some things only get better with time. Listen, take a load off, relax, get a drink. Sounds good, but I do want to know the story. It, it was all meant to be. And you guys are married, right? That's a long story, too. Is that right? I would really love to hear that story. You know what? You two are the youngest couple is here, so let's go with you. Yeah, we need a reminder of young love, uh, first moments and stuff like that. Uh, it's pretty simple for us, really. We went on a first and second and then a third date and just kind of continued and here we are and we're exclusive now oh i didn't realize we were exclusive i i thought what is that supposed to mean i don't know we just never talked about it I, things just kind of fell into place i didn't think we like needed... just oh. kidding yes we are exclusive oh. now kind of what do you mean kind of kim throws up her arms and shrugs uh i don't know she had you there bro look at him that was a little funny what am I supposed to say? The way you say it, date one, two, three. Huh, huh, huh. You make it sound dirty, like wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. I didn't mean to make it sound like that. Oh, come on, you two. He seemed okay. So I was like, fine, one date. And he was nice. So I went on a few more dates with him. I was nice. That's it. You didn't give off any serial killer vibes. I'm sorry, but what kind of people were you dating before you met my man over here that nice became good enough? That's a long story, too. But I want to hear your story since it's your anniversary. Yeah, I don't know if you're ready for the story just yet. It's long and complicated. We're ready. Oh, what he means is that you're not drunk enough because apparently someone thinks that's a big, long joke. Best reserved for when people are drunk. Come on, babe. It's not like that at all. What is it like, then? I, well, I, I well, mm -hmm. he, here's what it is. When I tell the story, our story, because it's so special and in so many ways, totally epic, I like to not only say what happened, I want to take everyone with me on a journey back to that time and place where it all happened. I want you to experience the joy, the love, the magic that was in the moments that changed my life. Mm -mm -mm. Preach, brother man, preach, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Honey, shut up, you're drunk. Come on, we're just having fun. It's nothing special, really. <laughs> nothing special? Really? Oh, girl, you and only you know how to hurt my heart. Oh, please. Can you be any more dramatic? Of course I can. I'm Indian. Drama is in my DNA. Melodrama was pulsing through my veins before I even had a heartbeat. God, I need a drink. Shots! 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 Chaperones the picture of whatever they are having with flair and fills everyone's glasses as if he were a priest dishing out holy water at the start of the apocalypse. In nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti om shanti shanti shanti. Oh. Oh. Rough face palms, Kim laughs. Rahul pours out a shot of bourbon and sprinkles it over everyone on stage and perhaps if the spirits called for it in that moment onto the audience in front of him. Rahul downs the shot. I propose a supposition or uh, suppose a proposition. <laughs> How about 
We do sleepover tonight, yeah? Who's with me? Uh, seriously. Uh, maybe you want to have a private discussion with... Amna traipses over to Rahul and gazes into his eyes. The answer is yes, but the question must be asked. Rahul returns the gaze. A few moments as both Amna and Rahul peer into the other's eyes and slowly but surely both smile. Folks, there you have it. She said yes. You didn't say anything. Our souls are connected. We don't always need words to communicate. But it's her birthday. Maybe she wants to spend some alone time with you. Oh, please. Alone time is often time like falling asleep, watching TV after dinner. What she means to say is that it's peaceful and comforting. You don't speak for me. I only speak for us. Uh, so, uh, where were we? On the verge of epic. <laughs> and you'll be next, so get your story together. My story is all together. Nav sits next to Ro, holds her hand. Right here. Rahul puts some oomph into his back and shoulders and straightens up. Lights shift. It was a dark and stormy night. What are you talking about? It was a beautiful day. Hey, it's my story, and yes, it was the darkest of nights and the stormiest of seas. Hurricanes full of tornadoes had torn through my days. Things that my work had worked me over big time. The chick I was dating at the time broke up with me in the worst possible way. And if that were not enough, my groceries would spoil before I could use them. Damn rotten potatoes and sour milk. True story. I was, I was there, bore witness to this poor, pathetic, downtrodden, heartbroken life through those dark ages. Like he said, true story. And every word I utter will be the truest they shall ever be. Aho! Yeehaw! That's right. Um, where was I? You were telling this, this epic. <laughs> Marcus of days and mm. all of that. Hurricanes, tornadoes, and heartbreak. Oh, oh, have, have you heard this one before? You, you tell me if you have. Ah, I would, and I have, but it never gets old. It's one of my favorites. May I, my love? Amna gesticulates, surrendering the stage. Amna observes, and in her own private manner, relishes Rahul's narrative of their story. So, yeah. Darkest of nights, stormiest of seas, and blah, 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 blah. Y'all get it. We're over it. We've been there, done that, so I don't need to open old wounds all over again. Anyway, yep. Yeah. All of that happened, and I wasn't even living day to day. Back then, it was like the days, weeks, and months all blended into each other. No clear beginning, middle, or end to any of those days. It was, and still is, just a mush of life with no clear distinction between any moment in time. My rock bottom was a slimy-ass mud pit, and there I stayed for an unfortunately long time. And then, one fine day, this guy... <laughs> This guy right here calls me up. He's like, yo, bro, you gotta turn up, represent, hang out with the homies tonight. And really, I I I'm just ready to crash. And he's like, you gotta come with me. We're going to this banging ass party of a friend of the wifey. She's totally hot, freshly single, just like you. And I was like, no way. And he was like, oi, bae. And I was like, yo. And he was like, bro. So yeah, long story short, he talked me into showing up. And so I did. And, and here, there, no, here, right here is where I stood when she came over, smiled at me and said, hi, welcome. And a part of me went, hubba, hubba, hubba. And another part of me went, yeah. And another part of me went, hot diggity dog. I'm gonna tell you something. And don't you dare say this to anyone else. A whole lot of me that day went boing. I turned up for my homie here and the first thing I got was turned on. Like, full on turned on. Honestly, decency didn't matter in that moment. I was like, bring it on. So as it turns out, it's not just a party, but it's her birthday party. And here I am standing, staring at her like a deer in headlights. And she says, thank you so much. These are so precious. I love them. You're the most handsome, charming man I've ever met. <laughs> I picked up, you know, a, a little bunch of sunflowers on the way over because I'm cool like that. And I didn't even realize that I handed them to her. Can you believe this crap? Trust me, I'm better on my feet than that usually. But, you know, what, what can I say? She had swept me off my feet by then with that gorgeous smile of hers. And right before I blurted out something totally dumb and inappropriate, these two showed up and introduced us, you know, using formal, polite language. She had this 
short little shiny number on. The version, the vision of her urged me out of the swamp I was living in. The twinkle in her eyes sparkled her magic, chipping away all the muck and mire and malaise off me like it were never there in the first place. What can I tell you? She was and continues to be the silver lining to my clouds. Rahul walks over to Amna, asks for and takes her hand and leads her to a spot on the stage where both hold each other close, their faces lightly caressing the others. Both dance a slow, sensual tango. And guess what happened next? We held each other close. Our breaths mingled, our heartbeats synced, and we danced. I told her my life story. She laughed at all the funny bits, empathized with the tough moments, and she held me close when I spoke of heartbreak. All of this holding on to me, her smile, the twinkle in her eyes. I was holding a piece of heaven in my arms, and I was in love. 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 Come on, y'all. You already have the invitation. What are you waiting for? Grab your love. Join us. Nav, Ro, Mike, and Kim arise. Nav and Mike jet over, hug erratic hands all over each other as they whisper utter wail and screech, I love yous, while blowing kisses in the air, showboating the epitome of frat boy bromance. A few moments later, Ro cuts in, asking for the last dance. Hey, you two should get a room. Oh, hey. There you are. Sorry, bro. Love you. But love her more. Later. In one smooth motion, Nav spanks Mike and places his palm on Ro's butt and grazes up to the small of her back, pulling her close. I'll never need a room with anyone. I have a home with you. You always will, my love. Nav and Ro lean their foreheads together, place their hands over the other's heart. Meanwhile, Mike dances alone, urging Kim to join him. Kim stands her ground. Mike, one, two, three steps over to Kim. The three couples eventually dance in unison, their movements in sync. Kim giggles and laughs, putting an extra ounce of energy into her dance. You okay? Babe, you realize this is the first time we've ever danced, right? I love it. I love you. Kim pauses mid-step. Another first? Kim nods and kisses Mike. Everyone dances a few moments longer. Each pair, in their own time, find an easy moment to settle and eye gaze. Shots, 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 shots. Everyone reacts appropriately as they release their lovers from the dance. Rahul replenishes everyone's glasses. To Valhalla. To love. To firsts. And to lasts. Forevers. Marriage. Or whatever lasts longest. To whatever touches us the deepest. To all in each moment that affect our soul. End of scene. For now. Yay! Take a bow, take a bow, take a bow. Fabulous work. Love this dinner party. Love these characters. Um, You have us like in the palm of your hands. Like what is going to happen here? Is this Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Like, how, what's going to happen <laughs> at the end of in this play? Um, very cool, very cool. Great work. Keep writing it. I can't say this enough to all the playwrights. Keep working on pages. Bring pages to the Playground Experiments volumes um, and, and share them with us. We want to know what happens next. And after you do that a few times, you get to do the uh, first reads. We've had several playwrights from Voices of America go on and do the required reading in the first read series, um, which is great to help you get to the next draft after you finish that first draft. So just keep working and just know that the Playground Experiment is here for you. You've got a home with us. As long as you show up, um, the Playground Experiment will show up for you. Um, Mike, any, any parting words? Great work on night one of our Voices of America. You're muted, by the way. Bring back, bring back my girls. Bring back everybody first. Everybody come back. <laughs> bring back my girls. Bring, bring back, back my girls. Uh, bring back. Give it up for a, give it up for our four writers tonight. Brilliant work! You are officially PGE writers. Fabulous, and the actors. You need to change your website. You're no longer an actor only. You are a writer. Put it on your website. Put it on your cards. Do people still have cards? Uh, and give it up for this brilliant cast. All of them taking their Wednesday. Oh, so good. The actors. Isn't really? it great to see actors bring your work to life? Like you, you didn't know. Like, oh, I didn't realize it was that good until. Um, no, I mean, I knew all your work was good. I mean. <laughs> 
<laughs> never mind. For say, but the actors are great. It's Everybody, so just unmute yourself quickly and give huge applause to all of our writers and our actors and for David. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do want to invite everybody on, on Friday. We've got four more writers from the Voices of America writing program. You might recognize two of them. Al, who was giving us our, our stage directions for three of the four pieces tonight. Al will be sharing uh, a piece, Keep an Eye on Him. And Mac will also be sharing his piece, Everyone Dies at the End. And as well, we also have Ivory Bennett sharing uh, Before We Go Too Far. And Denise Mendoza with What's Yours Is His for more great selections on Friday. Hop back, join us on YouTube and uh, for more. Any last parting uh, words, Mike? Yes. Uh, if also, if for some reason you're watching this on YouTube and you haven't subscribed yet, click down below, subscribe, uh, like the video. And also, if for some reason there is extra money in your uh, uh, wallet, uh, my name is not at the PGE on Venmo. It is Mike Lester, and I am the artistic director of the Playground Experiment. But we are at the PGE on Venmo, so feel free to Venmo us any thousands of dollars that you would like to send us. It helps us when we do our bigger programming. Uh, we do pay our artists for full, full, when we do full play readings, they get paid, and we are looking at... Uh, coming up some other events. Uh, that being said, Faces of America, which is our monologue books, currently on sale today on Amazon. We have two of them. $2 from every book goes to Black Lives Matter. Um, and if you be on the lookout, uh, Faces of America, boom, three, will be uh, are looking for submissions in the next couple of weeks uh, for our November. We just got the Lower Manhattan Council for the Arts, uh, LMCC, I Council Lower Manhattan Council. I we got a grant for our Faces of America <laughs> Festival, so uh, we're looking to expand it. So we will have it again. We are super excited. So that being said, if for, if you are an actor in the room or an actor watching or a writer, and you have ideas and thoughts of monologues, Faces of America, that is the theme. There has to be under two minutes. There will be a specific word that must be in the monologue. Be on the lookout because we will be taking submissions uh, to expand. Last year we had over three hundred submissions for 25 spots. So we are looking it's to tough. get 500 this time so we can really make our readers go insane. Um, but we are super excited. Again, a huge thank you to David Davila. Um, thank you to the actors uh, for giving your time. Amazing uh, writers. Writers class. for taking the plunge. If you're watching this and you are a writer or a write an actor, director, and looking to maybe be a writer, be on the lookout for future Voices of America classes that will be hopefully coming in the future. And uh, we'll ask our writers and actors to just wave and say goodbye to the YouTube land because we love you all in YouTube land, but you guys have drinks to have. So go have some drinks, have some, some cider. 